Hello everyone, welcome back to the mainstay of our categorical reading group. Today we're continuing uh, section one, in, or in fact finishing uh, chapter one, talking about adjunctions. And it's been a little while since we uh, actually were sort of on the main path, so let's just sort of summarize where we were last time. Um, we talked about natural transformations, and we, in particular we discussed the idea of a natural isomorphism, uh, and this was sort of the most powerful thing you could ask for between two functors, sort of preserving everything, commuting with everything, just being the best relationship that one could possibly get. And in particular, it's good because isomorphisms uh, induce bijections on homsets just by using the composition. Isomorphisms are invertible, so they should induce bijections. And oftentimes this is sort of the property that one would want to have for practical purposes. And it's not the only way that you can go about obtaining it. You don't need to have an isomorphism in order to have a bijection on homsets. And adjunctions give us another way to do this, and this makes them sort of the next best thing, although they sort of have to come in pairs. Let me give the definition. So we need two functors. Maybe we call them L, C, and D and R, D to C. Um, these will be what they call the left and right uh, elements of the adjoint pair. Uh, and so if we have this pair, then we'll call the pair L, R an adjoint pair, um, or maybe an adjunction, just not referring to the pair, but to the whole unit, and the left and right adjoints, respectively. If there's an isomorphism of bifunctors, from C op cross D to set given by the Homs with these particular functors. And this isomorphism is sometimes also called an adjunction. None of this ever causes any confusion because it's always clear from context what exactly I'm talking about. Um, it's a quick sanity check uh, from the Yoni dilemma to see that a functor, maybe L, admits a right adjoint if and only if uh, the functor that appears on the left here, this hom D with L, is representable. And exactly the same argument for R. Uh, and in particular, uh, this tells us that the adjoints are unique. Uh, something that I was confused about for a long time and only just realized, uh, and I'm sort of embarrassed to admit this, is what the origin of the name of an adjunction is. Um, and it actually comes from linear algebra. Um, in linear algebra, given a matrix, we had this notion of the adjoint, sometimes called the classical adjoint. I don't know why they called it that, but really just the adjoint. And what this did was if I had a linear map, maybe V to W, this had the property that if I, and uh, of inner product spaces, that if I had an inner product, uh, let me just maybe super make this super easy and not worry about this, um, like so, then the adjoint map, usually denoted by T star, I could move it from one to the other and it would preserve the inner product. That's what's happening here, right? I'm taking L and I'm moving it to the other side um, of the of the HOM bifunctor uh, and, and getting an isomorphic, not equal because I don't necessarily know what that means, but I'm getting an isomorphic HOM set. Um, and so what's going on here is this bifunctor is sort of like an extreme generalization of, uh, of a bilinear pairing, if you like. Um, in fact, for lots of practical purposes, that even sort of makes sense because oftentimes you can add elements in HOM and you can multiply elements in HOM. So, you know, for, for lots of familiar categories where HOM has its structure, this, is, this generalization actually isn't even that extreme. Um, but that's sort of what's going on here. Uh, it's this idea of moving things from one piece to the other. 
Okay, so now let's take a look at this in a little bit of detail. Let's say I have um, some x in C, and by the adjunction, this would give me an isomorphism um, D. If I look at the image of LX to itself, then I get an isomorphism um, C X to RLX. And if I take the identity map in here, then I can look at the image under this thing, under this isomorphism, goes somewhere over here. Um, and we have a name for this map. Um, we call this guy Epsilon. Sorry, there's some junk on my screen. Um, where was I? So yeah, so we take the identity map and we map it forward by this isomorphism. And this gives us the map Epsilon, which Epsilon gets us from the identity in C to RL. Maybe I should call this the uh, Epsilon of X. Um, because I want Epsilon, that I'm, as I'm defining it here, to refer to all of this happening at once as a map of functors. Um, and similarly, if I play the exact same game with R going the other way, then I can obtain another map, which I'll call eta. Uh, this should go, oh, uh, shouldn't be RL, it should be LR in that case. Whoops. To the identity on D. And we call this guy the unit of the adjunction, and this guy is called the co-unit. And this gives us some equations, which are rather important, the so-called unit and co-unit equations, which we'll write down. And these are that eta composed with L, composed with L composed with epsilon. What does this do? Well, I take L, and then this sends me over to LRL, and then this in turn gets me back to L. should be the identity. And similarly, R compose eta compose epsilon compose R goes R, R, L, R, R to the identity on R. And I'm writing all these parentheses because I want to be a little bit careful here. Um, I know that it's generally frowned upon to write lots of parentheses, especially sort of once one has learned the basics of this subject. Um, and we want to wean ourselves off of them, but in this case, it's actually kind of confusing if you don't. Like, you need to sort of be careful to understand what's being plugged in as an argument to what, like what, and what is being evaluated on what. So what's going on here is, uh, maybe to be even more clear, at least for the first equation, is I have L, which I can write as L composed with the identity in a sort of trivial way, and I send this to LRL. Uh, and then when I apply A to compose L with this, this eliminates the first LR and gets me back to just L. So in other words, like it's it's the first written left to right, but it's the second as canceled by this description. So what's going on here is I am introducing the RL on the right and then canceling the LR on the left. Okay. Now I'm going to state a proposition which says that these equations actually characterize um, adjunctions. So we have a proposition. Let L C D uh, and R D C be two functors and epsilon and eta uh, be morphisms of functors and suppose that all of these guys all four satisfy the co-unit equations which I'm just going to write like this uh, shorthand then the pair LR is an adjunction. Okay, so what we need to do in order to check this is show that with these equations we can define isomorphisms of bifunctors. 
excuse me, that's my Discord, not me. I apologize for any background noise, too. It looks like there's some people running around in my office building. So what we need to prove is that we have hum d lx y. Oh, sorry, uh, I want to prove this as functors, so this should be blank. So I need to prove that I have an isomorphism from here to here. And the construction is uh, not super difficult. We're just going to basically use what we have. And what we have is um, the following maps. Sorry, it's just very annoying. I hope you guys can't hear that, but I don't have the capacity to hide it. So anyway, what we have is we uh, a map here from hom d lxy to hom c rlx ry, which of course we obtain by just applying r. And then we can go back um, using the, uh, I want to cancel, this is the, 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 the unit, x, r, y. And, well, I guess this is epsilon. Is epsilon the unit or the co-unit? I always confuse this. Epsilon is the co-unit. Okay. I guess I'm going to have to just work really hard to make sure I get that right. Okay. And now we have also... Maybe I'll call this one. And then we also can do the exact sort of same thing uh, in reverse direction by first applying L and then eta. And what this does is get us from hum C, uh, X, R, Y, to hum D, L, X, L, R, Y, and finally to hum D, L, X, Y. And now what we need to do is check that these are mutually inverse to one another. Uh, and checking this is sort of straightforward because of these co-unit equations. The idea is every time we pick up a composition and apply the unit or co-unit, the co-unit equations tell us that this gives us the identity morphism of functors. And so the identity map is induced on all HOM sets, and that finishes the proof. Okay. Um, now I want to give a couple of simple properties of adjunctions. Um, these are things that are sort of uh, useful in practice. Um, I don't think that uh, any of these are going to be hard. So let's just hop right to it. The first is that adjunction plays nice with composition. What I mean by that is if I have um, three categories, maybe C, C prime, C double prime, and I have C c prime and i have an adjoint pair which people often draw with the double arrows going forward and backwards like so and then i have the same setup um maybe i'll call them l prime and r prime like this so i have two pairs of adjunctions um then i can produce an adjoint pair um c to c double prime uh you only, the only thing you have to do is be a little bit careful um drawing it out like this makes it easy to get it right um, what you have is first you have L and then L prime, and then going back, it's in the reverse direction. You have R prime and then R. And this is a completely trivial. Um, if you're the kind of person who wants to check it, just write down all the HOMs and just go forward and go back, and you'll see when I shuffle the, over the prime order gets switched. It's sort of like that shoes and socks lemma from group theory. Not at all difficult. Okay, um, and now let's give one more. And I think this will actually be more or less it for today. Um, there's a lot that we could talk about adjunctions. Like there's um, something that's kind of very dear to my heart, which is this um, uh, is the, the so-called yoga of growth and deep six operations. Um, and I would love to talk about that, but it, it's not going to fit into this video because we need to, you know, get to the point where we've developed some sheaf theory in order to talk about this. But I, I'm very excited for that day. Anyway, for the moment, let's just get to the proposition. Um, so let's say I have LR and I joint pair. Uh, between C and D. I didn't write that down, uh, so I'll just write it. And let's let eta and, or yeah, eta and epsilon, the unit and co-unit. Or 
respectively. Uh, then we have three properties. The first is that R is fully faithful if and only if eta from LR to identity on D is an isomorphism. I'm running out of space. I'll just scooch over. It's probably bad practice because now I'm cutting off on the other side. Let me zoom out a little bit. There we go. Uh, two, exactly the same sort of thing. L is fully faithful. If and only if, and probably you guys can guess this, epsilon from id C to RL is an isomorphism. Looks like it's just an A there, but there's an N there, I promise. Is an isomorphism. And then finally, um, we can put these sort of together um, to get the following equivalent characterization, which is that L is an equivalence of categories. Oops, one. I wrote I and then two. R is an equivalence. Uh, and finally, L and R are fully faithful. And of course, in this case, what we see is that L and R are quasi inverse to one another, uh, and epsilon and eta are then isomorphisms of functors. Okay, so to check this, um, it's sort of clear that there's a lot of redundancy going on here. So let's just talk about left adjoints, and the proof will be exactly the same for right adjoints by duality. So, proof. So let's uh, observe that if L is fully faithful, which I'm just going to abbreviate to FF, um, that's the same thing as having an isomorphism hom xy to hom lx ly, because fully faithful is telling us that this is a bijection. Um, on the other hand, if we have an adjunction, then this gives us a further isomorphism hom x r l y. Uh, but now we use the O'Neill lemma, and this tells us that this is equivalent. So this happens if and only if epsilon is an isomorphism. That was uh, the second corollary to Yonita's lemma, and I'll try to find the timestamp at which I discussed that and put a little card here so that way you can see it. Um, so that proves the first two. Now for the third claim, observe that if L and R are fully faithful, let me actually write this down. So this proves one, two. And now for three, um, if L and R are fully faithful, then epsilon uh, whoops, epsilon and eta are isomorphisms. And this gives necessary, uh, these give the necessary isomorphisms that it takes to check the definition of equivalence. So that's really all there is to do. That finishes our proof. Okay, so this has been a little bit shorter than previous videos, but that's good because I feel like the other ones have been getting really long. Um, we'll reconvene next time to discuss, uh, starting to discuss the chapter two material. And maybe or maybe not, we'll see about uh, having some other people contribute to these videos besides just me, since we have a good sized reading group. Maybe it's uh, time one of you guys takes over. But we'll talk, we'll make some decisions. I'm excited guys, talk soon.